Amen. All right, let's uh, open up uh, the Bible to 1 Thessalonians. Welcome, you guys at home, online, tuning in. It's good to be with you in that capacity. We're studying in uh, 1 Thessalonians. We started our, our last, last week, we started our first study in that, in chapter 1. And in our last study, we saw something that was uh, pretty obvious. This was something that we could see that Paul had this real thankfulness for the believers in Thessalonica. And we saw that it was a, a brief visit. We read in Acts chapter 17. It was on his second missionary journey. Only three weeks there. And yet there was this great response to the gospel. Meaning that there was these tangible, seeable Fruits. There was evidence in the believer's life of the transforming power of the gospel. Fruit, evidence of this response. That's what we saw in chapter 1, verse 3. Check it out. He says, he, he was talking about making mention in a prayer for them. He says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. They put their faith into action. We see in their response to the gospel that they served with this greater purpose. We saw that they had this hope that, re that remained steadfast despite difficult circumstances and despite opposition. It's interesting, <clears throat> verse 3 here, this could be helpful for you, it, it actually becomes a bit of a, an outline for First Thessalonians. And this might help you remember how Thessalonians go, because in the first three chapters of First Thessalonians, chapters 1, chapters 2, chapters 3, Paul deals with their works of faith. And he's thanking them and remi being, remembering their works of faith. And then in the first half of chapter 4, he deals with their labor of love. And he kind of focuses on the, the present time. And then the second half of chapter 4 into the beginning of chapter 5, he focuses on their future hope. The steadfastness of hope. So work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. This is kind of how 1 Thessalonians is laid out. And we ended our study, our last time here, with their response of repentance, which led them into this willingness to serve. Look at verse 9. He says, chapter 1, verse 9, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. You turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Repentance and acts of service is a very natural response to the gospel. Meaning when you get saved and you realize that God's grace for you, the natural response is this repentance and acts of service. And I love this. Uh, it, it, it became this great testimony to those who were around them, as it said in verse 8, that all had heard in that area. But notice here the progression of repentance. And I made mention of this last week, and I think it's helpful to us. In verse 9, the progression of repentance was turning to God. That means that you turn your back on idolatry. And so this is the best way to explain repentance, to, to turn to God and turn your back on idolatry. And what happens there is God becomes the focus. So instead of focusing on how can I do this thing, how can I uh, you know, be better at this, or, or what acts of service can I do, or, or, or focusing on a sin that I gotta get over this sin, I gotta conquer this sin, rather turn to God Plug into his source of power, and you'll turn your back on idolatry and turn your back on the sin. And the focus becomes on God. And look at this, verse 10. 
it says that this was their focus to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come as they had this new focus it inspired a hope for the future looking towards Jesus's second coming gives us future hope which gives us present help right future hope present help so looking forward to Jesus' second coming the, the Babylon Bee I don't know if you're familiar with them they're a satire news group and it's satire it's great though good stuff they uh, just I think it was yesterday put out a new article here's the title of the article study finds a connection between checking in the news and longing for Jesus' return <laughs> duh it's a great article you should check it out the language that Paul uses here in verse 10 to wait for his son from heaven has an idea of eagerly anticipating it's kind of like the the first time mom or dad as they eagerly anticipate the birth of their first child you know you read some books Catherine you read any books yet <laughs> you take birth in class you learn what the signs of the times are in fact, I remember we took this birthing class and there was all of these, you know, you, this, this booklet. Anyways, Shawnee didn't follow the booklet. I'm like, wait, we didn't, get, we didn't do page 7 8. You're already on 10. <laughs> For me, this included remodeling the house twice and buying a new car. It included praying. It included Preparing your family for this coming. This is the type of language that Paul is using when he's talking about waiting for the Lord Jesus to return. You're looking. You're watching. Maybe you're reading some books. Maybe you're getting in tune with the signs of the times. You should be preparing your family for the return of Jesus Christ. As believers, we are waiting for Jesus' return. We're looking forward. We're paying attention, preparing our families. We believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He's going to come. He's going to rescue the church. And God then is going to pour out his wrath on the evil ones on this earth and those who reject him. This is what he says. It comes in this form of wrath. Look at verse 10. It says right here, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. When we studied through Revelation, we learned that at the beginning of the, the Great Tribulation, there are these seals that are broken that initiate this great wrath to come. And of these seals, as they're poured out on the earth, it says, Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, it says that the, the, then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who is able to stand. This is going to happen. For the Christian, this is not a doom and gloom message. This is a Whew, thank God Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. Through the death, the burial, the resurrection, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his blood shed for you, we are rescued from the wrath to come. And this fueled Paul's passion. He felt purpose, even in times of difficulties, in times of pain, and because he, he knew future hope gives present help. Check it out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, 
We had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. So coming from Philippi into Thessalonica, we read in Acts chapter 16 about this experience that Paul had, where they were there ministering, Paul and Silas, and they had casted out this demon from this young gal who was a slave, and she was telling these fortunes and making her master money. They cast out the demon there. They, had, they were preaching Jesus as the Messiah. This angry mob we read in Acts 16 comes against them. They end up, uh, it says in, in Acts 16 that they were hit with many blows. They were beaten. They were thrown into jail. They're there in jail. Earthquake happens. Doors open up. The chains fall off. The Roman jailer thinks everybody has escaped. He goes to kill himself, and Paul yells out, Hey, we're here. The jailer is so moved by their act of faith, he simply says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts of faith preach. When, when you live your life out by faith, it preaches. But they had this experience here. The, the jailer so moved, he becomes saved. We read in Acts 16 that his whole household becomes saved. They're then released from prison. And into Thessalonica they go. Verse 2, he says right here, After we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God admit much opposition. Last week I asked you a question. Why does the Christian experience trials? Why does the Christian experience trials? difficulties, and trials. I suggested a few different reasons, and I even suggested maybe it's not about you. Could it be the very hardship that you're going through, that you have gone through? It's not about you. Maybe it's about those that are around you. Maybe it's about God using your testimony for his glory, so that others would know the power of the gospel, so that others would be set free. Paul had been beaten, he'd been thrown into jail, and a whole household gets saved. Who's going to write that script? <laughs> Who wants to get casted for that role? He experienced deliverance through the trial, and then he comes into Thessalonica with what? What does it say there? With, come on, look at the scripture. Verse 2. He comes at Thessalonica with what? Boldness. Yes, boldness. Could it be that your trial, your hardship, is to give you boldness? You can have boldness, you can have confidence in the midst of opposition as you experience God's deliverance. The gospel, the power of the gospel, is boldness. In fact, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God. So you don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. And I do want to say, as I'm, as I'm seeing here, as Paul operated, as he conducted himself, it wasn't about being arrogant, but it was about the truth. Check it out, verse 3. He says, Our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing to men, but God who examines the heart. 
So it's not about pride, it's about the truth. It's not about condemnation, it's about conviction. It's not about sin, it's about salvation. It's not about the creation, it's about the creator. And they found their approval in God, not man. And so speak as pleasing to God, not pleasing to man, and did so with a clean conscience full of conviction. I talked to you about this last week. So important for us to operate with a clean conscience and conviction. The truth is, though, what God speaks through his word is not always pleasing to men, is it? What God speaks in here is not always pleasing to man. As we point people to what God says through his word, you will be rejected and you may even be labeled as offensive. One of the basic principles of the gospel is that you are a sinner found guilty before God and you need to repent of your sins. People don't like their sin called out. People don't like to be told that they're wrong. Anybody here like to be told they're wrong? (laughs) Matthew chapter 4 says, when Jesus began his ministry, these are the words that he started off with. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what Jesus started with. Those aren't man-pleasing words. Hey, you're wrong, and you need a change. Normally, that you just be able to put up a big wall, right? And get starting to get defensive. It's our human nature. Sometimes the thing that you have to say is not going to be pleasing to people. But you've got to say it. Because you need to be pleasing to God and have a clean conscience before God. He says, he says here, God's the one that examines the hearts. Paul was so convinced that Jesus was the way, the truth, the life, that there was no other way to God the Father except through Jesus. He was convinced of this. He had this conviction, so he had to go and preach it. But this would require people to turn from idols, turn from the traditions of men, and to trust in Jesus. Remember that uh, Paul had this practice. We read in Acts 17 that he would go and he would reason with them with the scriptures. And he would take the scriptures and he would point people to Jesus as the fulfillment of those scriptures, that Jesus was the Messiah. He was, he was the Christ. And I don't see in that model that Paul came off as prideful or arrogant. He was just convinced. And so at times that we ha- that need to say or we need to act in a certain way that's that's pleasing to God and, and not man, I believe that we can do it in a way that's not arrogant, not prideful. We can communicate. S- say we are so convinced by conviction of the Holy Spirit that we have to say or we have to act a certain thing. I believe that we can do it in an honoring, respectful way. Ephesians 4 says to speak truth in love. And so I think that this is going to be the challenge for us as, as we have, maybe someone in the world would say, an offensive message. And so we have the truth. We've, we've got to speak the truth. But I think there's a way that we can do it that's honoring and respectful. It'll be effective. Now, they may reject it, and they may still say it's offensive, and, and people don't want it. But as we're convinced in our own minds and hearts that we have to say it, We've got to do it because it's got to be pleasing to God and not man. I like this idea that he just recognizes that in verse 4, it is God who examines our hearts. And this points us to have this clean conscience with God and to know that it's God that knows our hearts. It matters what God thinks of you, not what man thinks of you. It matters what God thinks of you, not what man thinks of you. How often, though, we put this bigger emphasis on what people think of us. And I know certain personalities lend to that a little bit more than others. 
But so often we put this bigger emphasis on what people think of us rather than what God thinks of us. Let's be concerned about what how God thinks of us. And let's be tuned in with what he says in his word. Paul says here he didn't come with a selfish agenda. He only came to, to give of his life for the sake of the gospel. In verse 6, so he said he didn't see glory from men. And then even though, middle of verse 6, or even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. He says, but, verse 7, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children, having so fond of affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. For we recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Verse 10, he says, You are a witness, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you, believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I see in this little section here that Paul's method of ministry was threefold. Number one, verse seven, says that he approached them as a nursing mother would care for her baby. I have to be honest. I was there very thankful that I didn't lactate at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Sorry. But you know what? My wife wasn't put off by it at all. She wasn't put off at it. She wasn't angry about it. I had a bit of an anger. I'm screaming. <laughs> she wasn't put off by it. A nursing mom is not put off, it's not angry with a baby that needs care. You know, when we choose to minister to people, at times, they can act like a needy baby. And it will require your gentle, patient care. And when you're doing it right, you're going to be vulnerable talked about this with our elders on Wednesday night. When you're doing ministry right, when you're ministering to people, you're going to be vulnerable, and you might even get hurt. That's when you know you're doing it right. His second approach, well, just to, verse 8 was that first approach. He said they were, they were well pleased to impart not only the gospel, he says, but our own lives. The second approach here I see was this one of a working brother. See in verse 9, he says, Brethren, you recall our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to you. Verse 10, they, they came uprightly and blamelessly and behaved towards you. This approach would mean that they came alongside them with these pure motives. They weren't a, a burden. They didn't require their support. Rather, he supported himself at that time. In the book of Acts, that we learn that Paul had this trade of tent making. And when funds were lean on the mission field, he was able to employ his tent-making trade as to not muddy the waters of the gospel or cause some sort of hindrance. If people were hung up on money, he didn't want that to become this hindrance. He wanted them to receive the gospel. This model of working brother can have a great success coming alongside somebody, shoulder to shoulder. We could even talk about you know, getting into the trenches with somebody. We talk about discipleship, to understand what they're going through, to, to help them, working alongside them. Third approach we see in verse 11. As a father would his own children. You see this? He says, you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring. He uses this sandwich method, or as I like to think of it, the Oreo method. Exhorting, encouraging, imploring. Exhorting has the idea, it's a strong call. It's a charge. It can be hard. Encouraging, it's more soft. It's squishy, like in the middle of the Oreo. 
You can do this. You've got it. You've got what it takes. Here, let me give you what you need for success. Let me help you with this. And then he says, imploring. It means to summon. It means to call out. It's firm. And he says he does this as a father would his own children. Dads, this becomes a great model for discipline for us. Use a little Oreo method with your kids. You can be exhortive, have some encouragement in there, and then be firm. He applied this to the ministry opportunities with the new believers in Thessalonica. This nurturing mother, this working brother, this loving father. The Lord does this with us. Man, this is, we, you kind of get this picture of the Trinity right here. In John 14, we read about the, the, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit being the comforter. You know, my kids bonk their knee or they get a scrape. You know who do they run to? They run to mom. Because they come to me, is there any blood? No, go. <laughs> mom cuddles them, comforts them. The nurturing mother, the Holy Spirit. You know, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus says, whoever does the will of God is my brother. We get this picture of Jesus being this working brother. And then obviously, God the Father, exhorting, encouraging, imploring. For the purpose, all for the purpose, verse 12, the Lord does this in our lives so that, here's the point, we're going to end with this, here it is, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. God puts these people, God puts his word, God puts these events in our lives to disciple us so that we would walk in a manner worthy of our calling. God has given us this invitation to his kingdom. And as you've received that, and you respond by faith, not only do you come into his kingdom as a citizen, but then he adopts you and includes you as his family. And you're called Christian. And you're part of God's family, God's kingdom. And there's a particular way that we would walk that reflects our name. And this is where I want to pick up in our next time in Thessalonians chew on that. Consider that. Lord, I pray that you use these words for your glory. God, as we consider your discipling efforts in our lives, Lord, we would not reject them, but we would receive them and we would grow. We're so thankful that you have a care and concern for our lives. And you have not abandoned us, Lord, but you're there as a nurturing mother, as a working brother, as a loving father. Thank you, Lord, for your work in our lives. Thank you for this time. I ask for a blessing on everyone here. That you lead them and guide them by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.